Good morning and welcome to Grace on the Hill Church. We're so glad to have you. For those of you who are watching on YouTube live stream, for those of you who are present, God bless you. We're so happy to have you. Praise God. Uh, this morning, we're going to lift up the tithes and offering, and uh, we're going to start off there. We're going to, um, our uh, we're not having any praise and worship this morning uh, due to the fact that Brother Dominic, our worship leader, is sick. Um, so we're going to say a prayer for him, but not right at this moment in time. Praise God. Um, Brother Ethan, do you mind grabbing me this? Uh, grab me this over here, please. This document. Okay, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Praise God. So this morning in the Word of God, we were reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 9, verse 7, each of you should give of what you're, you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Can we all agree this morning the Lord loves a cheerful giver? Praise God. Today, let us embrace the joy of cheerful giving as we prepare to present our donations, tithing, and offerings. To give, simply scan the QR code on your screen using your cell phone, ca cell phone camera app, and you'll be taken to Grace on the Hill Church Secure Give website. And remember, brothers and sisters, that this is a secure uh, website, uh, and it's a secure uh, donation. Uh, it is encrypted. It has all the securities that technology could give today. So believe me, if you enter in your uh, debit card uh, or your ACH information, it is very secure. Uh, if you don't have your cell phone available, visit our website at www.graceonthehillchurch.com. That's also on your screen as well. And click on the Give page and then follow the instructions. Let's now bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude for the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for the opportunity to further your kingdom for your honor and glory. Lord, we acknowledge that everything we have is a gift from you, and we are called to be good stewards of these blessings. As we consider donations, tithings, and offerings, may we give cheerfully, not out of obligation, but with hearts overflowing with love and generosity. Heavenly Father, as we give our tithes and offerings, we pray that you multiply them for the greater good. Bless the hearts that give, and may your giving bring glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I have seen the pace of your life. The stress, the anxiety, the constant movement, rushing from one place to the next, chasing after your desires, or running from your fears. I see how you struggle, striving to meet your needs all on your own. I see the burdens placed upon you and the burdens you place upon yourself. In the midst of this chaos and hurry, I am calling out to you to slow down. Be still and know that I am God. It is I who set the earth in motion. It is I who sustains you, protects you, and provides for your needs. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Trust in me with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid, for I will never leave you. Let your soul find rest in me, 
and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. For neither death nor life, the present nor the future, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from my love. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Praise God. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little video there. It's all honor and glory to God. Amen. Praise God. He has overcome the world. And uh, we have to always remember that. No matter what we're going through this morning, the Lord Jesus overcame the world. Uh, we're going to get into prayer this morning. We have a couple of prayer requests uh, uh, this morning. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to pray for uh, Brother Stephen uh, Donaghy. I uh, Stephen, if you're watching right now, I apologize if I totally destroyed your last name. I my, not my intentions, but anyway, Stephen is asking prayer. He's saying, "Here, I'm saved, and I I I suffer with worry and anxiety and paranoia. I really get paranoid in many ways. I've had bad social anxiety. I get paranoia around people. I worry a lot. Please pray the fear will stop, and I'll be free from it, and at peace with and fearless and." Pray God will comfort my fears and pray he will place all my fears with his peace every day. Also pray I will be consumed and overwhelmed with God's comforting presence and love every day. Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Sister Renee. Uh, some of you may know know her. She's Sister Zahal and Brother Dominic's friend. Uh, her husband uh, apparently is uh, dealing with some health issues and uh, it could be serious, and so we're going to lift him up in prayer as well. I don't remember his name. I, I think Sister Joseph Hall just referred to him as uh, Sister Renee's husband. Um, and then we're also going to pray for our worship leader, Brother Dominic Gomez. Uh, he's dealing with uh, some illnesses in his body, and so we're going to lift them both up. And, and, and those of you this morning, if you have a prayer request, if you're needing prayer for healing or whatever it may be, feel free to reach out to us on our website at www.graceonthehillchurch.com. Again, that's www dot grace on the hill church.com and go to the prayer request tab and just complete the form there if you don't want to be uh contacted there's there's a checkbox for that like a follow-up um if you want to remain anonymous that's fine as well um so i encourage you this morning so we can lift you up in prayer as well praise god let's bow our heads in prayer heavenly father we come before you just thanking you Father, for your word says, Lord, that by your stripes we're healed. Father, we thank you right now for hearing our prayer and, Father, for answering our prayer. Father, we pray for Steve and uh, Dog Dogany right now, Lord, that you take away the fear, the worry, the anxiety, and replace it with your peace that passes all understanding, Lord. Bring comfort to his heart. Send your comforting angels to him, Lord. For your word says that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Father, I pray right now, Lord, wherever Stephen may be, Father, touch him, Father, with your power, with your presence. And Father, we come against the spirit of fear. We come against the spirit of anxiety and worrisome, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray, Father, for Sister Renee's husband. Father, who is dealing with a, 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 it could be a serious illness, Lord, a disease perhaps. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we believe and we trust in you right now, Father, that you're making his body whole as we speak. Uh, Father, we know, Father, that you're a God of miracles, Father. You're the God of healing, and we trust in you right now, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, because you're doing it right now. Father, we pray for Brother Dominic. 
Gomez, our worship leader. Father, he's dealing with some physical ailments and illnesses in his body. Father, in the name of Jesus, he also be healed, Father. By your stripes we're healed, Father. We know, Father, right now you're touching his body. And Father, give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding, Lord, of, of, of what we should eat, what we should be putting in our bodies, Lord. Uh, Father, because your wisdom that you give to us is important, Father. We have to take that into consideration, Lord, and every one of us this morning, not just Brother Don. Dominic Gomez, but every single one of us. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we pray that his body be made whole right now. Father, those this morning also who are dealing with similar situations or similar circumstances, Father, that are dealing maybe with heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, Father, that wherever they may be right now, Father, that you heal their bodies from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, Lord. And those who are dealing with depression, loneliness, anxiety, Father, worrisome, addiction, suicidal thoughts, Father, that you bring comfort and peace to their minds right now. Father, reach down to them. Father, in the name of Jesus, give them the peace that passes all understanding and bring comfort to their hearts. Father, in the name of Jesus, that they draw closer to you this morning, Father, that whatever they're going through, Father, reassure them, Father, that you have overcome the world. That although, Lord, sometimes we will have trials and tribulations, although our bodies may be afflicted or our minds may be afflicted, you have overcome, Lord, and we just have to put our trust and our faith and hope in you, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And as we pray, amen and amen. Praise God. God is good, isn't he? He is so good. He's so faithful. He's a faithful God. Praise the Lord. Uh, this morning, the title of our sermon is Crucified with Christ. And our theme scripture is Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 27. Being crucified with Christ calls us to a radical and intimate relationship with him. It invites us to participate in his suffering, to die to ourselves so that we might experience the power of his resurrection. It speaks to the willingness to die to our old selves, our selfish desires, our sinful ways. It means embracing the cross as the ultimate symbol of sacrificial love and redemption. When we fully grasp what it means to be crucified with Christ, our lives are transformed. We no longer live in our own selfish ambitions or temporary pleasures. Instead, we find ourselves with a purpose in serving and glorifying God. Our priorities shift and our hearts aligned with his will. Being crucified with Christ is a, a daily journey, a constant surrender of our lives to his lordship. It requires humility, perseverance, and deep trust in his perfect plan for us. But in this crucifixion, we discover true freedom, abundant life, and unshakable hope that comes from knowing that we are united with our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we dwell into this sermon today, let us open our hearts to the transformative power of being crucified with Christ. May his love and grace lead us to lay down our lives, take up our cross, and follow him faithfully. Let us embrace the profound truth and allow it to shape every aspect of who we are. Praise God. Let's bow our heads one more time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Father, for it is truth. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and your knowledge and understanding that you're about to impart in us this morning. Father, speak to us, Father, for your servants heareth. Father, I pray that you open every spiritual eyes this morning. I pray, Father, that your word not fall on stony ground. Father, I pray that the, your word, that seed, be planted on good soil. And Father, I pray that your word doesn't go in one ear and out the other, but that it be embedded on the tablets of our hearts. Father, that this not just be an every Sunday sermon, Father, but it be come a lifestyle that we continue to live for the rest of our lives. 
Father, to you be the honor and the glory, Father. And I thank you for the anointing that's upon my lips. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen and amen. For those of you who are following along in your Bibles, I'll be reading in the Amplified Version. Go with me to Matthew chapter 27, verse 11 through 54. Here we're going to read about the crucifixion of Jesus. And the importance of this is to understand the, how Jesus was crucified, what he went through. To put it into perspective of what Jesus was saying, to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. There's some things, brothers and sisters, that I believe, again, there's a facade in, in the church today, in many churches, not all, but many, where they believe that Jesus did it all, and he did. He did his part. Now we have to do ours. This is why he, he, did, he told us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. If he did it all for us and we didn't have to do anything, why would he say that? So this morning we're going to under, we're going to read here how what happened with Jesus as he was standing before Pilate here. Now Jesus stood before Pilate the governor and the governor asked him, "Are you king of the Jews?" In affirmation Jesus said to him, "It is as you say." But when the charges were brought against him by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. You notice here, Jesus wouldn't respond to the accusers, but he would respond to the to, to Pilate, who was not accusing him. He was he was unbiased. In verse thirteen, then Pilate said to him, "Do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you?" But Jesus is not answering them. But Jesus did not reply to him, not even a, to a single accusation, so that the governor was greatly astonished. How many of us are very defensive this morning? How many get very defensive? Listen, brothers and sisters, I'll I, I tell you one thing. I had, I had to overcome that. I, I think I'm still working on that a little bit. Some of us, we get a little defensive. Instead of just being quiet, be silent. And here Jesus, he's saying, listen, brothers and sisters, the scripture where it says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself means, listen, stop being defensive. When those accusations come at you, <laughs> And they say, oh, you're this and you're that. And I'm talking about believers now. I'm talking about the church. And they start, you are to just stay silent. Don't say anything about the accusations. Don't even tell your husband or your wife or your children or anybody else. Be like Jesus. This is what it is and what it means to be crucified with Christ now. If we say we are crucified with Christ, our actions should reflect it. So in verse, I mean, even uh, 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 Pilate was astonished. He's like, wait a minute, you're not going to defend yourself? In verse 15, now at the feast of the Passover, the governor was in the habit of setting free one prisoner whom the people chose. And at that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner guilty of insurrection and murder called Barabbas. Verse 17. So when they had assembled for this purpose, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to set free for you? You would have thought they would have said Jesus because he was innocent. But no, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called to Christ, who do you want? And for Pilate, for Pilate knew that it was because of jealousy that the chief priests and the elders had handed Jesus over to him. Even Pilate knew. Pilate was not a believer. But he even knew. See, brothers and sisters, when accusations come at you, false accusations, the world that can't even see it, you don't have to say a word. God will reveal the truth because he is the truth. He is the way and he's the life. In verse 19, while he was seated on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous and innocent man. For last night, I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. See, not only Pilate, but his wife, unbelievers. In verse 20, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. Wow, not even put him in prison. Not even to beat him, but to put him 
to death. How many of us are being put to death? The word of God says we're like sheep to the slaughter. The governor said to them, which one of the, the two do you wish me to set free for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all replied. The word of God says they all. Let him be crucified. Now, let's stop right here for a moment. Were these folks, these individuals, were they unbelievers? Ah, they were the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It wasn't the believers. It was the believers. See, this is what, uh, brothers and sisters, some of us may say, I can't believe this person being a Christian or this believer could do that to me or say that about me. What is wrong with them? See, and here Jesus is in that same predicament. And he said, why? What has he done that is evil? Pilate's trying to figure this out. But they continue shouting all the louder, let him be crucified. See, they couldn't even give Pilate a reason. They couldn't even reason with Pilate at all. In their minds are saying, let him be crucified. How many of us this morning are being crucified? And how many of us this morning are acting just like Jesus? Verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but rather that a riot was breaking out, this is how mad they were. This is how, uh, you know, how much they desired Jesus to be crucified. He took water and washed his hands to ceremonially cleanse himself from guilt in the presence of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people answered, let the responsibility for his blood be upon us and on our children. They basically cursed themselves. So even to the day, you see where Israel's at. Wars after wars after wars, turmoil after turmoil after turmoil. Because they called this, they cursed themselves when they said this. See, when those of, uh, uh, that falsely accuse you in the church, the believer, the so-called believers, not all of them are so-called, let me be clear. But when they do that, just, you know what you do? You stay silent. And you let them accuse you of whatever they want to accuse you of. And see to it that they're only cursing themselves. They're only bringing judgment upon themselves. But when you, when you engage... It's when you desire revenge. I'm not a doormat. I'm going to tell him like it is. Is that what Jesus did? I'm not no doormat. You're not going to talk to me like that. Do you know I'm the king of kings, the lords of lords? And here, when we have, praise God, I may have lost my mic. I believe we may have lost my mic. Sorry about that, brothers and sisters. We we thought we had an issue here with our, our mic. We heard like a little pop. And, and so <laughs> first thing that we think of is the batteries went out on my mic. But I had just changed those, I believe, last week. So here... Brothers and sisters, what happens is someone accuses us of something, and then we, in turn, we say, well, I'm not a doormat. And you sit and you go back at them and you tell them off, and you say, What you said wasn't right, and you better do this, and you better do that. But little do you know that, that, that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And yes, some believers can be evil because they give them place to the devil. Some people in churches, brothers and sisters, just so you're aware, just news alert, some folks in church are not where they need to be with God. And instead of being used of God, they're being used the devil because they're allowing the devil to use them. To what? To destroy the church. To cause division and discord among the brethren. 
You don't have no part with that. We shouldn't have any part with that. Instead, what we should do is say, you know what, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But see, the natural sinful character comes out of us sometimes. And we want to revenge. We want to, oh, you're not going to treat me like that. But see, this is not what Jesus told Peter. Peter, put down that sword. We don't fight like that when they come to arrest him. Brothers and sisters, we don't fight like that. I'm going to give them peace of my mind. They don't falsely accuse me of anything. And now you're a part of the equation. See, and the devil's clapping his hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I got them. You know why? Because they're so defensive. They're so defensive and they're always defending themselves. Brothers and sisters, listen, as a young boy, for some reason, and I could say it was the devil, of course, I was always falsely accused of something I didn't do. So growing up and in my adulthood, when somebody would accuse me of something, I would rise up and get mad and I would blow up and get angry. Until the Lord told me, look, son, listen, <laughs> I was falsely accused. You're going to be falsely accused for my name's sake. You see, brothers and sisters, when, when you know you're called, when you have an anointing upon you, when you have been chosen, there are going to be a lot of people talking about you, and I promise you it's nothing nice. Because they, instead of, of desiring the same thing from God, they in return become jealous and envious. And when they become jealousy and, and they have jealousy and envious, then they start falsely accusing you. Here Jesus, he is, and the Bible talks about it, that Pilate even knew that they were jealous of Jesus the Christ. See, Pilate wasn't dumb. He wasn't stupid. He knew. He, he could see it from a mile away, brothers and sisters. Let, God, God will reveal it all. Let people accuse you. Don't get defensive. Let them say, falsely accuse you of this and accuse you of that. And here we have, see, here, and here, uh, Pilate saying, hey, I, I am innocent of his blood. I see to it yourselves in verse 25. And all the people answered, let the responsibility for his blood be on us and our children. So he said, Barab is free for them. But after having Jesus severely whipped, he handed him over to be crucified. Imagine that. It, it wasn't, listen, it ain't nothing. These folks today that are on death row have it made. They go into a little hotel. I call it a hotel because it is. A little hotel room. They get fed. They get, they get it all. They're, gonna, they're not getting beat. If you were to go to prison for the sake of Christ, you'd go into a little, I call it a little hotel. Trust me, I've been there. I mean, I haven't been to prison, but I've been in jail. But I've been to a prison when visiting others, and I've seen their, hey man, they get, they get to eat some really good food. They get to buy their own food. They get to have a TV in their room. They get to have, you know, nice things, nice clothes. I, and I'm not talking about, I mean, they don't have the freedoms that we have, and don't get me wrong, but I, I'm in comparison to what Jesus went through. Not only was he sentenced to be crucified, he was beaten. He was whipped, severely whipped, the word of God says. In verse 27, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. Imagine that. You just got beaten. You have all these people around you looking at you. They stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him as a king robe to mock him. That's what they were doing. Oh, you call yourself king. Here you go. Here's your robe. How many times people make fun of you in church? You're praising and worshiping God, and they're making fun about how you're praising and worshiping God. Oh, look at that crybaby again. He's crying. Oh, and it gets to you. See what I'm saying? What I mean by it gets to you is someone says something, hey, uh, so-and-so is saying and making fun of you when you're up there praising and worshiping God, and you're lifting your hands and you're crying. See, be made fun of. And brothers and sisters, listen, and I address this because it's not addressed in, across pulpits and, and across the United States of America today in churches that it should be. Listen, I'm not here to, to call down the church and, and, and to tell the, 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 the newcomer, the baby in Christ Jesus, to discourage them or anything, but to, to let them be aware of what they need to do. When situations like this arise, 
So here the Bible says, and, and they stripped him and they put a, a, a scarlet robe on him as a king robe. And, and again, it was to mock him in verse 29. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, again, in mockery. Oh, here's your crown. Here, You want your crown? You want your king crown? Here you go. We're giving you a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand as a scepter, making him to be like a king. And again, this is all mockery. Kneeling before him, they ridiculed him saying, Hail, rejoice, king of the Jews. Ha, 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 ha. You can just hear him laughing, mocking him. And then it goes a little further. Verse 30, they spat on him. I, I don't know about you. I've never been spit on, but my father has. And he told me a story about when someone came up and spit on the back of his neck. Because he was telling them about the things of the Lord. They didn't like him. They're at school. And they took a reed and they struck him repeatedly on the head. See, my brothers and sisters, when, when we hear the story about Christ, his crucifixion and what he went through, a lot of times we, and we hear songs, they're talking about beating, they talk about whipping, but here the word of God is breaking it down for us. I, it wasn't just a whip. It wasn't uh, just it was being severely, uh, severely whipped. He had a, he was mocked. He was teased. He had a, a crown of thorns put on his head. Can you imagine that? You ever, you ever been poked by a thorn? I remember one time playing football and I, and we got tackled into a rose, rose thorn bush. And let me tell you one thing. I was jumping around like a, like a wild man. It hurt. Because you imagine that going into his head, and then they 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 kneeling before him, they laughing and ridiculing him. Hail, King of the Jews! And then they spit on him. Listen, they didn't stop there, and they took his reed and struck him and struck him repeatedly on the head. And after they finished ridiculing him and making fun of him, that's what ridiculing means. They stripped him of his scarlet robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Brothers and sisters, I've been through a lot in my lifetime. But I have never been through this, what Jesus went through. To put it into perspective, brothers and sisters, I think we have to stop being narcissistic with ourselves, being self-centered and deny ourselves. Because listen, we, we're, we have not even come close to what Jesus went through. Because he spoke the truth. And because you believe in the truth and you speak in the truth. Listen, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You're not going to have many friends. As you see, Jesus was there by himself. He didn't have those, you know, his disciples or anybody, you know, advocating for him as a victim. Everybody was against him except for Pilate and his wife. There was nothing they could do because the people ruled. It was it was a vote per se as as they all voted and the vote overrode the pilots and his wife's decision to say hey he's innocent. How many of us this morning are going through this? Where well, the, this this situation that Jesus went through? I don't think many of us are, and I, I have to think about like third world countries like China and Russia. Maybe they are, but here in the United States of America, not a bit, but it's coming. It's coming, brothers and sisters, it will. Verse 32, now as they were coming out, they found a man of Serene named Simon, whom they forced into service to carry the cross of Jesus. I want you to understand something. They forced him. They didn't ask him. They forced him. And then they came to a place called Golgotha, which it means a place of a skull. They offered him wine mixed with gall, which is myrrh, a bitter tasting narcotic to drink. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it because he knew something's not right here. <laughs> this ain't good for me. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among him by casting lots. Verse 36, then sitting down there, they began to keep watch over him to guard against any rescue attempt. And above his head, they put the accusation against him, which reads, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Again, this was another mockery. 
So even after Jesus, listen, is hanging on the cross, he's not hanging on the cross yet, but they put this, this accusation above his head. Well, obviously he's hanging on the cross because they put it above his head. And at the same time, two robbers were crucified with Jesus. So yes, indeed. So they were they were uh, mocking him. They were ridiculing him still, even as he's hanging on the cross. And at the same time, two robbers were crucified with Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by were hurling and ridicule. And, and they said tauntingly, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourselves from death. Save yourself. No, they're talking about talking to Jesus. So they didn't stop. He's hanging on the cross, dying. And these folks, and again, these are the religious Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, 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 men of, of that time. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And you notice Jesus still didn't do anything. Being God in the flesh, still kept quiet. He didn't say, oh yeah, let me show you. How many of us would do that this morning? Oh yeah, you're mistreating me, you're doing this. Oh, let me show you. You're falsely accusing me. You're, you're, you're being mean to me. Oh, let me show you. In the same way, okay, so this is, again, these are the chief priests. These are the leaders and the scribes and the elders. They mocked him. So this is the word of God's very clear. It wasn't the unbelievers. It wasn't the sinners, per se, the ones that were, didn't know Jesus Christ, didn't know God at the time. And this is what happens, brothers and sisters. And, and let me say something. A lot of babies, innocent babies, and, and people in church, they, they are destroyed because of this. Because, listen, brothers, we have people in churches today who have been crucified themselves with Christ. And what happens is this. It's like I was watching this, this, this uh, clip of this lion. And there was a cub nearby. And for some reason, it didn't like the cub. And that male, full-grown lion grabbed that cub and devoured him like nothing. It's of his own. This is this is your own blood. This is your own, your own people, your own animal. You're, you're the lion. It's a lion. It's a baby lion. And this is what happens in the church today. We destroy our own by what? By 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 being so again, being allowed allowing the devil to use and and to do to do these things. And and again, listen, brothers and sisters, even though the devil was using the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, Jesus still stood silent as they mocked him and they ridiculed him, they beat him. And they say he can save others in verse 42. He can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe him and acknowledge him. They wanted to say, oh, you, you're this and you're that, you're anointed one. Let's see you do this. Let's see you do that. Let's see you handle this. And brothers and sisters, we're going to be tried. The word of God says we're going to be tried. We're going to go through trials and tribulations. We're going to be, listen, all the apostles and the disciples all went through something. They all were tried. They were all beaten. They were put in prison. And they were eventually killed, the majority of them. Martyred. Some of them stoned to death. Others decapitated. And my son, the other night, we were having Bible studies with my daughter, who wants to get baptized, one of my daughters. And, and he mentioned, you know those swords back then weren't very sharp. And, and you look at Peter, who was crucified upside down. See, and I, w I was reading the saying yesterday, I believe it was on Facebook, it was a post, and, 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 and someone really brought up a good point. They said, you want to be called and you want to be chosen. You want to be a prophet. You want to be used to God. But then you don't want to suffer for it. These men, these women, the mighty men and men of God and the word, and the word of God, they suffered. They suffered. Every single one of them suffered. How many of us are denying ourselves this morning, taking up our cross and following him? 
How many of us are truly crucified with Christ? Or is it just the saying? Is it just words? Is it just going into the facade of things? You know, it's like, you know, again, I'm not here to, to throw stones at the Catholic Church, but all it is is, is repetition and it's it's words. It's like, oh, I memorize, yep, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not yet I, but Christ lives in me. Ooh, someone, hey, you know what? You did this. Oh, no, I didn't. Get over here. Wait a minute now. Are you just saying you're crucified with Christ? Or are you acting on it? Are you, is your fruit showing? Is the tree that, is it, is it showing? And the, the fruit that it bears, is it showing that you are crucified with Christ? Listen, brothers and sisters, this is not a club. When you, when you decided to serve the Lord, when you decided to surrender to him, when you decided to submit your life to him, when you decided to make him Lord over your life, you signed up to suffer for him. And, and then we're going to read on about being crucified with Christ. And, and, and I might be getting a little ahead of myself here. But we have to understand, brothers and sisters, what Jesus went through. And, and this is what we have to understand. What he went through, we're going to go through. It's like this, brother. I'm going to give you a good analogy. It's like going up and signing up for the military, right? Brother Ethan, you go sign up for the army. And you're out there and you're training and you're doing all this and you're doing great. And oh, but when it comes to war, they're like, hey, uh, Ethan, we're going to send you over to over there to Iran because we're, we're, we're at war now. And all of a sudden, you're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want bullets firing at me. I didn't sign up. Uh, yes, Ethan. Bustamante, I um, <laughs> hate to inform you, but you know, when you signed on the dotted line. You signed up for this, yes. Bullets still be flying at you. And yeah, you may die. You may be blown up into pieces. And you may be seeing others dying next to you. You might see some really bad things. But this is what you signed up for. Brothers and sisters, we shouldn't repent, get baptized, and get filled with the Holy Ghost and not be willing to suffer for the things of Christ. Listen, contrary to what you hear from other preachers preaching across the pulpits in the United States of America today, many, not all, Oh, God is love, he's peace, he's joy. Oh, yeah, that's okay. You turn around and punch someone's teeth out. Oh, just, it's okay. You'll be all right, sonny boy. And, and, and brothers and sisters, this is not what, what, what it's all about. You're going to suffer. People are going to come against you. You want up upon a time before you were serving the Lord, had many friends, but now you have many enemies. You used to have your family members and you know invite you over to their house and to wine and dine with you, and that's no longer happening. You had family members and friends talk good about you, but now they no longer do. They talk down at you. They try to create problems for you. I have one question for you this morning. Are you crucified with Christ? Are you truly crucified with Christ. Listen, it's not words that we should be saying. Listen, I could quote you the whole entire Bible. I could recite every verse. But what good is it if I'm not applying it to my life? What good is it when I go to be stand before my Lord of Lords and Kings of Kings in the judgment day? And he says, son, you did very well in memorizing all my word. But you never applied it. You were never truly crucified with me. And at that day, brothers and sisters, we have to understand something. Jesus, he's going to judge us based on what we've done in this life. He's going to judge. Listen, brothers and sisters, I, I can tell you right now, uh, don't read the word of God like a storybook. And some of us do. Uh, what we do is we read about the sufferings and we're like, oh, yeah, that was them. Poor fish. Poor guys. Not me. No way. There's no suffering in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Nah, I got news for you. Open up your Bibles and read it. There is suffering, brothers and sisters, and this is part of being crucified with Christ. Go with me to Matthew chapter 27, verse 43 through 54. Matthew chapter 27, verse 43 through 54. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Now, we're, uh, I'm sorry here, brothers and sisters. We're continuing on with Matthew chapter 27. Just moving on to verse 43. 
again, these are the, these are the religious folks. Okay, these are the scribes and the Pharisees, the the Sadducees, the the the, the religious leaders. They're saying he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God, again, with mockery. The robbers who had been crucified with him began also to insult him in the same way. Imagine that. They're hanging on the cross too. Insulting Jesus. I want you to, re we're going to come back here, okay? I want you to remember this verse. Verse 44. Now, from the sixth hour of noon, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., which it's not supposed to be dark at that time. Noon to three is not dark. You look outside right now, and it's, a, you know, it's about to be 11 o'clock. It's, it's light out, right? And we know that there, during this time, it's, it's, it's not dark, but the Bible says that there was darkness. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud and agonized voice, Eli, Eli, lama shakatani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's hanging on the cross and dying. And verse 47, then some of the bystanders who were there said it and uh, heard it and began to sing, this man is calling for Elijah. See, I'm telling you, these religious people, some of these religious folks and their, their man's traditions and standards you know, make things up a lot of times, you know? Oh, that's not the word of God. That was for that culture. That was for that church. That was, you know, Paul was talking to that church, not to us. And uh, These are these type of folks. In verse 48, immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and soaked it into sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to drink. So there happened to be someone who was going back for Jesus. Someone who really took in consideration what he was going through. But the rest said, so there's only one, only one. The rest said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him from death. Again, they're still mocking him even as he's dying. He's hanging on the cross and they're still mocking him. In verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud, agonizing, an agonizing voice and gave up his spirit voluntarily. And at once, the veil of the holies of holies of the temples were torn from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split apart. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints of God who have, were fallen asleep in death were raised to life. And coming out of the tombs after, tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. These were people, listen, brothers and sisters, this is not preached as well. Not only was Jesus, uh, listen, he died, and, and as he's dying, and he gave up the ghost. Uh, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom of the holies of holies. And there was an earthquake and the tombs opened, but the tombs opened of the saints who were dead. And and coming, and they came out of the tombs after and entered the holy city and per, appeared before many people. Now the centurion and those who were with him kept guard over Jesus. When they saw the earthquake and these things were happening, they were terribly frightened and with, filled with awe. And they said, truly, this was the son of God. Truly, that brother and that sister have been crucified with Christ. Truly, there are servants of God. Truly, they have been crucified with Christ. And it's all those accusations, your accusers, your abusers, those who've done you wrong and dirty. One day, we'll see. But see, the problem is, is we always want to prove a point. And see, Jesus wasn't there to prove a point. Listen, he was in the body. He was in the flesh just like us. Don't, don't, get, don't get it wrong. He, why would he say, Father, why, why have you forsaken me? My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Why would he say that? Because his, he could feel, he had feelings in his limbs. He had, you know, he had emotions and, and he has a, he had a mind. He, had, he, he could feel things. He could, he could not only from a, from a, a you know, a perspective of, of pain, but of agony. But we say we're crucified with Christ. Are we truly crucified with him this morning? Go with me to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 27. And here it is. So you want to be a Christian. So you want to get baptized. You want to, you want to give your life to the Lord. Listen, I got news for you. You're, doing, you're making the best decision you could ever make. 
But you know what? With that decision comes some consequences. And listen, brothers and sisters, it's not back. I, I'll suffer for God at any moment, any time. And I have suffered for him, and I rejoice in it. I rejoice because of my rewards in heaven. It ain't here. I'm not rejoicing through this pain. I'm not here on earth. I'm rejoicing that I'm going to be dancing with my Jesus on streets of gold. I'm going to be, listen, I'm going to be up there with him and, and, and rejoicing with him forevermore. And it's worth the cost crucified with Christ. And here in verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to follow me, oh, let me tell you, like that good old atheist told me one time, hell is full of good intentions. Oh, there's many that wish to follow Jesus. But see, Jesus doesn't follow, uh, doesn't stop there. See, he says, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciples, he must deny himself. That means set aside selfless interest. It's not about you anymore, you poor fish. It's not about what you want and how you want it. And I, well, that's what I believe. And that ain't no more like that. It's none of that. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. And take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. And follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example, and, and, and living, and if need be, suffering perhaps of dying because of the faith in me. I like how the Amplified Version breaks this down. See, it's not just it's just not just you know, repenting and baptizing, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's going to be all peaches and cream, and everything's going to be great. <laughs> You're going to have to deny yourself. Number one, that's the hardest thing to do as a human being, because we are selfish beings, just naturally. The simple nature is selfish. It's all about me, 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 and me. And Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself. See, this is part of being crucified with Christ. You say you're crucified with Christ, you need to deny yourself. So deny yourself from what? Oh, retaliation, from vengeance, from you know, being defensive. Uh oh. I can hear a pin drop right now. Because you know why? The majority of us think, again, brothers and sisters, they, we read these scriptures, we read scripture, but the problem is, is we're, not at, we're not applying these scriptures. We're not acting on them. And take up this cross. In other words, you're going to suffer. This is part of it. You're going to suffer. And, and, and if you don't want to suffer, listen, brothers and sisters, you don't have to do this. It's like, you know, going to sign up. Let's say Brother Ethan shows up to the Army's recruiting office. And, and he says, hey, I'm, I'm looking to join the Army. Okay, sit down, Mr. Bustamante. And let's tell you what it's all about. Well, guess this is what you're going to do. You're going to go through boot camp, okay, for, for about four to six weeks. And then, you know, we're at war now, so um, you're going to have to go to war, and you might get killed, you might get blown up, you might lose a limb, you know, you might, and then that's at the point in time, Brother Ethan goes, um, uh, yeah, about that. Uh, no thanks, and you walk out. See, brothers and sisters, listen, the things that should happen, and, and, and I, and, and brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this with all love and sincerity. When we, when we're, we as leaders of the church, pastors and preachers and ministers, we need to be teaching our, our brethren, our babies in Christ Jesus up front, before they repent, get baptized and get filled with the Holy Spirit, about the suffering. Are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to be crucified with Christ? If you are willing, then, okay, let's go to the next step. And that's repentance, and getting baptized in the name of Jesus and getting the Holy Ghost. Now you're committed. But the problem is, is a lot of people get baptized and get baptized because they don't want to go to hell or because fear is instilled in them. They don't, oh my gosh, I know God's coming and I don't want to go to hell looking for all the wrong reasons. You know, you don't do that because you, you know, of your fear. You do it because you love Jesus and you want to have a relationship with him. You want, to, you want to surrender to him. You want to be submitted to him as Lord over your life. But you're going to understand something way up front before you even talk about repentance. Are you willing to suffer for the things of Christ? Are you willing to be crucified with him? And if they say, oh, no, no, uh, I'm, I'm out, I'm not me, I'm sorry, I can't do that, then you know that, you know, listen, that, that person would have never been crucified with Christ regardless. Brothers, this is serious now. <laughs> I'm telling you, brothers, you can go through the motions all you want. 
You can go repent, get baptized, get filled with the Holy Spirit, and you go through the motions. Listen, I, those, that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But listen, before you do, you better, you better know the consequences before you sign up. Verse 25. For whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it. In other words, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to suffer for Jesus Christ. You're going to lose it anyway. You're going to die one day. But whoever loses his life suffers. For my sake will find it that is life with me for all eternity. Hmm. It's worth suffering for Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters. And let me tell you something. I can tell you from an example, from experience. Verse 26, for what will it profit a man if he gained the whole world? Well, fame, success, but forfeits his soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is coming to in the glory and his majesty of his Father, his angels, and he will repay everyone in accordance to what he has done. I want to go back, brothers and sisters. I told you I would to where the robbers had been crucified with him, began to insult him in the same way. Now, I didn't go over the scripture there where Jesus, one of the, the robbers, acknowledges that Jesus is an innocent man. And, 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 and he starts saying, you know what, telling the other robber, we don't, we deserve to be up here, but you don't. But you notice that when they were assaulting him, Jesus didn't say a word to them at all. But instead, when this man is defending Jesus, hanging on the cross, defending Jesus, Jesus turns to, me, to him and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Why was that? Listen, Jesus didn't sit there and defend himself. How many of us this morning who are being defensive could tell somebody, look, hey, you coming at me with all these accusations, I want to tell you I love you and I'm praying for you. God bless you. Is there something I could do for you? Is there anything I, I see you, you know what, you're hurting financially? Here, here, here's, a, here's a couple hundred dollars. That's what, in essence, of being crucified with Jesus Christ. Go with me to Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 35. Now the large crowds were going along with Jesus, and he turned to them and said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, when he's saying the word hate to your brothers is not how we understand it, okay, is hate. It means like if, if, if we don't, if, if we love our father and our mother, our wife, our children and brothers and sisters more than God, we cannot be his disciple. So this morning, brothers and sisters, part of the, being crucified with Christ Jesus is not loving your children, your family, your wife, your husband, anything more than Jesus Christ, because you cannot be his disciple. You cannot be crucified with Christ and, or say you're crucified with Christ and yet love everything else more than him. Verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross, in other words, who is not willing to suffer and follow me, and, I, and again, believing in me, and I like how the Amplified breaks this down, conforming to my example of living, if need be suffering or perhaps dying of the faith in me, cannot, cannot, cannot be my disciple. Oh, but Lord, he's full of love and grace and mercy, Pastor Nathan. I don't believe that. Well, you know, one day you will believe it. On that day of judgment, I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to judge, brothers and sisters. I'm just telling you, look, listen, the Bible says that you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. I'm preaching the truth. I'm preaching what thus saith the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm just the messenger. Don't kill the messenger now. This is the word of God. This is what it says. It says what it says, and it means what it means. We can't sit here and continue to, like a lot of churches out there, not every one of them, and sit there and, and, and just baby everybody and, and, and sugarcoat everyone, everything and, and say, oh, no, God's not like that. Well, pastor, what does it say here in Luke chapter 14, verse 27? Oh, well, on that, let, let's talk about that later. And they avoid it. But brothers and sisters, I'm not here to avoid anything. I'm here to say, hey, this is the truth of the word of God. And I'm going to preach what thus saith the Lord. Whoever does not carry his own cross and suffer and follow after me and follow after me and be obedient to him cannot be my disciple. Listen, 
Brother Ethan shows up to that army recruiting office, but he's not willing to go to war. He cannot be an army officer or, or a soldier. And they'll tell him there, sorry, sir, um, Mr. Bustamante, you cannot be a soldier. Oh, you hurt my feelings. Oh, that's it. I'm never coming back here again. Almost sound like Donald Trump there. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, it's the reality and the seriousness of the of the things of God. It's it's not a club, my brothers and sisters. It's not a some type of subscription or membership of of a, an organization. This is your life. This is your eternal life on the line. I'm telling you one thing. I want to know the truth. If, if, if you know, and I'm sure Brother Ethan here, if he's going in, he wants to know the truth into an army's uh, recruiter's office. He wants to hear the truth. Tell me the truth, so I know to make a decision of whether or not I want to proceed. Verse twenty-eight. For which one of you, when he wants to build a watchtower for his guard, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to finish it? Are you willing to calculate the cost before you repent, get baptized, and get filled with the Holy Ghost? Are you willing? This morning, are you willing to be crucified with Christ? It's, it's, it's a serious question, brothers and sisters. This is not something that we should take nonchalantly, but we got to take this to heart this morning. Stop going through the motions. Start Stop with the routine and the rituals and thinking like, oh, I'm good. I go to church on Sundays. I go and I, I worship. I'm on the praise and worship team. And I, I do all this. And, and, and see, and the thing is, brothers and sisters, by those works, we're not saved. That type of works, we're not saved. The works that we're saved by is by being obedient to the word of God. And see, and the word of God saying here, he said, listen, if you were to build, and he's saying here a watchtower, if you're building a home, and if you don't calculate the cost, like, hey, wait a minute, that is going to cost me uh, at least $500,000 because, look, I'm going to itemize everything, all this wood, all this material, all these supplies. It's going to cost me. And, and you're not willing to do that. Isn't that absurd? Isn't that unrealistic when you go to build something? And this is what, and this is what, what the Word of God is saying. Whoever does not carry his own cross, who's not willing to suffer, cannot be my disciple. And follow me. Follow after me. Be obedient to my word. You can't. I'm a child of God. Oh, no, you're not. Not if you're not carrying your cross and obeying him. You're not. I'm not. It, that goes for me too. Let's be real, brothers and sisters. Are you in this just to play games? Are you in this just for oh, the feel good, to, you know, the, the uh, facade of religion, Man's religion making you feel good. Oh, he preached about love today, Pastor Nathan. This preacher over here, oh, it was so good. He preached about how much God loves us. That's beautiful. But then he preached to you about being crucified with Christ. You hear this, brothers and sisters, this message preached across the majority of the pulpits in the United States of America today. And it's sad. It is sad because, listen, brothers and sisters, they're going to be responsible. Not only, listen, you're going to be responsible for your own salvation because if you want to follow the blind, you go right ahead. Knowing that they're blind and yet you still follow them, you're going to end up in the ditch. And you know what? Don't blame the blind person that led you there. You became blind right with them by following them. I'd rather be, my eyes be spiritually open to the truth of God's word this morning than to be blinded by it. You have to sit there and go, wait a minute. Where are all these scriptures? If we could, brothers and sisters, you put it all into perspective from Genesis to Revelation. If you put the Word of God into perspective and you read it and you understood it that was spiritual wisdom, you would not question the Word of God whatsoever. You would not say, I don't believe that. No, I don't believe it. That's your interpretation. Oh, that was for that church back then. That was for their culture. They had to do. <laughs> well, the whole Word of God is for a different culture than ours. So we're. I guess we're not saved, I guess, because it doesn't apply to us. All the love and the mercy and grace was for them back then, not for us. That was their culture. That was their time, not, not for us. How absurd is that? Moving on here, verse 29. Otherwise, when he said, when he has laid a foundation and is unable to finish the building, all who will see it began to really ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish because he didn't calculate the cost. He wasn't able to finish his race. That brother, that sister, they weren't able to finish the race because they weren't crucified with Christ. They didn't count the cost. They, 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 in their sufferings, they gave up. They quit. 
Some of us are just a house that's halfway built because we ended up quitting after this counting the cost. Or we just didn't count the cost up front. Verse 30, saying, this man would not be able to build, as uh, 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 began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he's strong enough and with 10,000 men to encounter the one who's coming against him with 20,000? <laughs> See, I, I love how the word of God is putting this in perspective. The Lord Jesus is putting this in the perspective here. He's given an analogy. He's like, don't be stupid. Count the cost. Verse 32, or else if he feels that he's not powerful enough while the other king is still a, a far distance away, he'll send an envoy and ask for terms of peace. <laughs> I'm counting the cost here. Man, is it worth it or not? Or am, am I just going to throw in the towel? So then none of you can be my disciple. Here it is, verse 33. Underline this, highlight it, circle it, do whatever you got to do. Copy, paste it all over your wall of your, your desktop monitor. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not carefully consider the cost that for my sake give up all his, uh, all his possessions. In other words, none of you can be my disciple who does not consider the cost the suffering and not willing to give up all your possessions. In other words, do you love those more than you, than you love Jesus Christ? Therefore, salt is good, but if the salt has become tasteless, what will it be seasoned? It either neither fits, is neither for the soil nor for the manure pile, or nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear and heed my words. Jesus here, this is and see, this is Jesus speaking. The Saint Paul, the Saint Luke, the Saint. This, this, this is Jesus speaking. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear my words, be crucified with Christ, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You're going to suffer. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And here it is. We could quote this scripture over and over and over. We could memorize it. We could sit there and post it up on our on on our on our screensaver. We could, you know, put it up in our bathrooms. But if we're not acting on it, brothers and sisters, it's all for naught. I have been crucified. The Apostle Paul was speaking here in, in Galatians. He's, as he wrote this. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live. It's no longer about me anymore. It's no longer, not, it's not about Pastor Nathan anymore. But Christ lives in me. In other words, now I obey Jesus Christ. I'm a slave to him. I do what he wants me to do. Because I am no longer of my own. I don't make my own decisions. It's not about me anymore. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So in return, I give up myself for him. Crucified with Christ. Are you crucified with him this morning? Are you just saying you are? Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 27, the next chapter over. Here we have Apostle Paul speaking. Again, he says, for though for you who are born again have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, and are children of God, set apart for his purpose with all with full rights and privileges through the faith in Christ Jesus. For all you were baptized into Christ into a spiritual union with Christ and anointed and hold yourselves in Christ. That is, you have taken on his characteristics and values. In other words, you know what? All his characteristics, everything he went through, you're going to go through. We've been set apart, but, but listen, brothers and sisters, we were baptized into Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be crucified with him. I'm going to take on that uh, suffering uh, with joy in my heart. Again, brothers and sisters, if you're, if you're trying to serve the Lord with the natural mind, 
you're going to have some problems. It's the spiritual mind that you have to put on. Be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Put on the spiritual mind. Because if the natural mind is going to be like, if someone came up to you today, put a gun to your head, the natural mind is going to be telling you to shake a little bit. You got a gun pointed at your head. But see, when you have a spiritual mind on, you say, hey, uh, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Oh, death, where's thy sting? Where, oh, great, where's thy victory? Praise God. Oh, Heavenly Father, here I come. I can't wait to be in your arms. What you're going to be like? If you wish. But no, supposed to be begging for our lives because our lives mean more to us than Jesus Christ. We're not crucified with Christ. If we're if we're so afraid to die, are you truly crucified with Christ this morning? Brothers and sisters, this is, I tell you, it's getting real and real, real, real fast. Romans, go with me. Romans chapter six, verse one through twenty-three. Understanding that being crucified with Christ mean, means that we shouldn't continue to practice sin. We shouldn't habitually sin anymore. And here, Apostle Paul is addressing it. He says, what shall I, we say to all this? Should we continue to sin and practice sin as a habit so that God's gift of grace may increase, increase and overflow? Certainly not. How could we, the very ones who died to sin, continue to live in any longer? You crucified it, supposedly. But see, if you weren't taught to crucify before repentance and before baptism and, and receiving the Holy Spirit, then you, you, you got to come back to the crucified part, the willingness to be suffering, what the cost. And in verse, thir verse 30, it says here, are you ignorant? I'm sorry, verse 2. Certainly not. How can we, the very ones who died to sin, continue to live it any longer? Verse 3. Or are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We're going to suffer. You have to listen. There are things, brothers and sisters, sin that I used to do before I rededicate my life to the Lord that I used to enjoy that now, you know what? Listen, I don't enjoy anymore because I crucified it. It's been crucified. Verse 4. We have therefore been buried with him through the baptism into his death. So just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory and the power of the Father that we too might walk habitually in the, renew the newness of life. How, how am I going to walk in the newness of life? Is by being crucified with Jesus Christ. Verse 5. For if we have become one with him in the likeness of his death, we also have been one with him and share fully in the likeness of his resurrection. There it is. So, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine being crucified with Jesus Christ because I'm going to be resurrected with him one day. <laughs> I'm perfectly fine with being, I'm being crucified with him. And verse 6, we know that our old self, our, old, our human nature without the Holy Spirit, was nailed to the cross with the, there it is. You must say, Pastor Nathan, what does it say about my sin being crucified? There it is. It was nailed to the cross with him. In order that our body of sin to be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the person who has died with Christ has been freed from the power of sin. Are you crucified with Christ this morning? Moving on, verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe also that we live together with him because we know the self-evident truth that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. We have that same blessing. We have that same favor. We have that same grace. Verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin and in its power, paying the sin of debt once and for all. And the life that he lives, he lives to glorify God in the unbroken fellowship with him. In verse 11, even so, oh, you got we got a part, Brother Ethan? We got, oh, we got a, we got a part in this. I thought Jesus did it all. Well, let me tell you something. If, if Jesus didn't do it all, we couldn't do what we could do. We our, 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 It wouldn't even matter what we did. But he did his part, now our part. Here it is in verse 13. Do not go on. Here it is, uh, verse 11. So even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and your relationship broken to it, but alive to God and in a broken fellowship with them in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust and passions. Why? Because you have crucified it, or you should have. 
You should have crucified it. If you're still practicing sin this morning, brothers and sisters, it's because you never crucified that sin. You never truly repented. Verse 13, do not go on offering members of your bodies to sin as instruments of wickedness, but offer yourselves to God in a decisive act as those alive, raised from the dead to a new life, and your members, all the abilities sanctified, set apart as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin will no longer master over you, since you are not under law as slaves, but an unmerited grace as recipient of God's favor and mercy. But again, shall we continue in sin that the grace of God may abound? God forbid. Yes, there's grace. What's God's grace? It's his favor. Yeah, we have his favor. But it's not his favor to go and sin. It's to be, you have to crucify your habitual practicing of sin. Yes, we all sin and come short of the glory of God. It's the unintentional, unknowingly sin. And maybe it's annoying, it's something, a sin that you knew you did, but you're not practicing it. That's the difference. You're not habitually practicing that sin because you crucified those sins. The unintentional, un un unknowing sins are going to happen. Yes, the Word of God talks about that. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, we we, we all have sin. Listen, and, and, but but listen, brothers and sisters, pay very close attention here. Don't let the devil lie to you now, because of God's grace that you can practice habitually practice sin. Yeah, it has to be crucified with Christ. Moving on now, verse fifteen. Then what are we to conclude? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under God's grace? He answers this very simple. No interpretation here. I don't know about you, but it says, certainly not. That's your interpretation, Pastor Nina. I could just hear it. I don't know how you interpret English unless you speak in Spanish watching this right now. I could try to, I don't know that much Spanish, but I could try to interpret it for you. But other than that, there's no interpretation here. He's saying very clearly here, because we're under grace doesn't mean we have a right to practice sin, habitually practice sin, because it has to be crucified. Do you not know that when you continually offer yourself to someone to do his will, you are slaves to the one you obey, either the slaves of sin, which leads to death, or, or obedience, which leads to the righteousness and standing with God? Verse 16, I want to reread that. Do you not know that when you continually offer yourselves to someone to do his will, you are the slaves to the one you obey, either slaves to sin, are you obeying sin this morning, which leads to death, or are you being slaves to obedience, which leads to righteousness and being right standing with God? Verse 17. But thank God that you were, though you were slaves of sin, you become obedient. Now, again, I like how Apostle Paul, he, he, he puts a positive spin on this. You know why? Because he's he's hopeful. He's hoping that, listen, you're, you're not practicing sin. We're not pra habitually practicing sin. He says, but I thank God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient with all your heart to the standard of the teachings and what you were instructed to and what you were committed. Verse 18. And having been set free from sin... You have become slaves to righteousness. I'm speaking in familiar human terms because of your natural limitations, your spiritual immaturity. Brothers and sisters, we're being crucified with Christ. This is being crucified with him. You crucify that passions, those lusts, those desires of sin, the habitual practicing of sin. Verse 19. For just as you present your bodies, your bodily members as slaves to impurity and to moral lawlessness, leading to further lawlessness, so now offer your members as slaves to righteousness, being in right standing with God, leading to sanctification that's being set apart for God's purpose, being set apart from sin. Verse 20. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. You had no desire to conform to God's will. You know why? Because you weren't willing to be crucified yet to Christ. Verse 20, so what benefit will you get at from that time of things in which you are now ashamed? None. What benefit do you get by still practicing sin? None. For the outcome of these things is death. What death are we talking about here? Spiritual death. Because see, the physical death, I mean, that's a one-time ordeal, but a spiritual death is eternity death. Verse 22, but now since you have been set free from sin and become willingly slaves to God, you have your benefit resulting in sanctification, being made holy, set apart for God's purpose, and the outcome of this is eternal life. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is worth it to be crucified with Christ. It is worth it to crucify the habitual practicing of sin because we earn eternal life. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. Matthew chapter 43, verse uh, through 48. Praise God. Here we have Jesus speaking. What does it mean to be crucified with Christ? See, there's a lot of different aspects to being crucified with him. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love, that is unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Because you have been crucified with Christ. You're no longer defending yourself. You don't have to defend yourself. What you do is you pray, you love on them, you, you ask for them, Lord, forgive them. And verse 45, so that you may show yourselves to be children of your Father who is in heaven. Listen, that's how you're a children. Listen, you'll be crucified with Jesus. Jesus did the same thing. When he was uh, ridiculed, mocked, made fun of, uh, being and crucified. He, he, he didn't sit there and hate them. He didn't sit there and, 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 and yell obscenities to them or cuss words or, or, or tell them, look, I'm coming down from here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe you all out. He didn't do that. So you, you may show yourselves as children of, of your father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise, his sun rise on those who are evil and those who are good, and he makes the rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? There it is. If I'm crucified with Christ, I'm willing to suffer the main fact, Brother Ethan, that if I love somebody, they may not love me back in return. Do not, here it is, do not even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brothers, wishing them God's blessing and peace, what more than others are you doing? <laughs> I'm only nice to the brethren in the church. Everyone else, no. Because you don't want the world rude to me and crude to me. I'm not opening the door for them. No. Nah. They're not nice to me. Why should I be nice to them? Are you truly crucified with Christ this morning? Here it is. Do not even the Gentiles who do not the, the Lord do that. Verse 48. You therefore will be perfect Growing into perfect uh, spiritual maturity, both in mind and character, actively integ uh, interrogating God's, integrating, excuse me, godly values into your life as your heavenly Father is perfect. How am I going to be perfect? You can't be perfect yet. Listen, the majority of us, a lot of us, you know, and I say this, brothers and sisters, just, just based on my observations, okay? As a lot of us say we're crucified with Christ, but we're not. And the only way you can be perfect with Christ is that we start off by being crucified with him. And then and that takes us to deny ourselves, taking up our cross and following him and obeying his word. This is how we become perfected in him. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Crucified. How many of us this morning, brothers and sisters, but let's just be real with ourselves. And I know I've asked this question a couple of times now. And you may say, Pastor Nathan, you're being redundant. You're repeating yourself. You already asked that question. But brothers and sisters, let's just be real. Are we truly crucified with Christ this morning? First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the Christ, the cross is foolishness and absurd, absurd and illogical to those who are perishing in spiritual death, death because they reject it, but to us who are being saved by God's grace and the manifestation of the power of God. What is Apostle Paul saying here? See, the message of the cross is foolishness. The message of being crucified with Christ is foolishness to the absurd and the illogical ones. To those who are perishing and spiritually dead, 
They can't understand. Listen, brothers and sisters, the word of God says, and I've said this before in my sermons, in my prior sermons, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is the word and the word is God. Therefore, you have to serve God in the spirit. You have to have that relationship with him in the spirit, not the natural. Even though it starts off that way, you have to start off in the natural and then it transforms to the spiritual or transitions into the spiritual. But so when somebody hears this message, and some of you may hear this message and go, that's so absurd. You got to ask yourself, am I spiritually dead? That I'm not understanding the word of God and what it has to say to me? Go with me to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 26. Praise God. Brother Ethan, can you grab me some tissue, please? Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 26. When we're crucified with Christ, brothers and sisters, we're not willingly practicing sin. We're not habitually practicing sin. We're not doing that. Because we have crucified it with our desires, our lusts, our passions. We have crucified it all. Here in Paul's Paul saying, now the practices, practices of sin, of the simple nature, are clearly evident. They are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, total re irresponsibility, lack of self-control, idolatry, sorcery, which is witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy. Oh, jealousy? How many of you this morning are jealous of your spouse? I just hear crickets. How many of you this morning are jealous of your spouse? You see some, you know, you husbands see a, a, a man look at your wife or come and talk to the, your wife or vice versa. You, the wife sees the husband go talk to a woman or a woman comes up. Are, are, are you being jealous this morning? Listen, let's, let's put it into perspective. Listen, we could quote this scripture. We could read this scripture all we want, but let's, let's put it into reality. The simple, that's part of the simple nature of jealousy. You may think like, oh yeah, idolatry, witchcraft, of course, that's civil nature. But the word of God here says jealousy is too. Are we being that? Listen, brothers and sisters, God gave you your wife. God gave you your husband. And if they choose to do what they do, listen, they're going to give account to God. You you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't, don't be acting with jealousy. Fits of anger. How many of us are getting angry at times? Disputes, dissensions, disputes, arguments. How many of you uh, Christian couples are always arguing all the time? That's a simple nature. Oh, Pastor Nathan, let's be real. Everybody argues. Do you have to? Or could you be like Jesus and say, honey, I love you. I'm praying for you. I think you don't, it's a misunderstanding. How about we just pray together? Instead of attack one another and belittle one another and, and, and sit there and degrade one another to a point where we started talking about divorce. This is the practice of sin of the simple nature, brothers and sisters. Dissension, fractions, factions that promote heresies, envy, drunkenness, righteous behavior, and other things like these. I warned you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, Pastor Nathan, you got to be kidding me. If I'm practicing jealousy, I want to inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, that's what the word of God says. I'll read it for you again if you like. Open your Bible, read it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 26. This is what the Word of God is saying. You can't inherit the kingdom of God if we're doing this. See, if we're practicing these things, jealousy, fits of anger, arguing, dissension, strife, causing strife, hostility, being hostile towards people, you're not going to make it. You know why, brothers and sisters? Because you have to crucify it. You have to be crucified with Christ. Because you're going to say, no, I'm no longer going to practice these things. Even jealousy and anger, arguments, <laughs> I'm going to knock that. I'm not going to do that because I'm crucified with Christ. I just like a sheep to a slaughter. <laughs> I'm going to suffer for his sake because I'm crucified with Christ. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit. See, here it is. If you're crucified with Christ, here's where the fruit of the Spirit comes in. Is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Brothers and sisters, 
If you say you're crucified with Christ, but you're not reflecting love, joy, we're not. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We were never crucified with Christ. Against things, these uh, such things, there's, there's no law in verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus, here it is, here it is. For those you for those doubters out there, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature together with his passions and appetites. You heard me mention it earlier. Here's the scripture that correlates with what I mentioned earlier. And, and it also coincides with what I was just saying earlier, reading the, the, the uh, verses 19 through 26. All those sinful nature, listen to what it says here. <laughs> See? <laughs> it says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified. The sinful nature, along with his passion, of the jealousy, the anger, the, the arguments, the idolatry, the, the strife, the hostility, all that has been crucified. Do you belong to Jesus Christ this morning? We all really have to ask ourselves that question. Many in that day shall say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty miracles in your name? Did, did, did we, you know, he shall say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Was it because you never crucified the sinful nature? Is it because you didn't crucify yourself? You were willing to suffer for the things of God. You were willing to suffer for the kingdom of God. You were willing to be crucified with him. If we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit, which means we have to have the actions. We have to act on the Spirit. That means that we have to have the fruit of the Spirit. If I say I have the Holy Spirit, I have to reflect love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I have to do it. Listen, brothers and sisters, because I can sit here and speak in tongues all I want. And if I say I have the Holy Spirit and I don't show the fruit of the Spirit, there's a problem. You're doing a lot of talking. We have to understand, brothers and sisters, God is a peculiar God. He's a peculiar God, which means that the little things do matter. Oh, but uh, you're like the young rich man. Well, I followed all the commandments, Jesus. Oh, but you lack one thing. What's that, Lord? You're always jealous of your wife. You're always jealous of your husband. You're always just jealous of other people. As simple as that. Something little like that. Because God, the Word of God says God is coming for a church with, that's without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. Folks, that's perfect perfection at its best. News alert. We we got to get it right with God. See, see the thing is, is, is the Bible, the Word of Jesus told his disciples, strive to enter into the straight gate. Strive. In other words, you got to do make every effort. And this is the thing, you got to be a, every effort to crucify the, the sinful nature this morning. So that when you have, you say you have the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is radiating through you always. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 through 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, that's perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding, and slander, be put, put, put away from you. With every along with every kind of malice, all despitefulness, verbal abuse, and malviolence. Brothers and sisters, listen, 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 listen I'm going to tell you something. If, we're, if we're, we're, we're being bitter and we have wrath and anger, we're not making it to, to heaven. We're not. Okay? I, I, I hate to be the one to inform you, but I am. Because, listen, this is the Word of God. This is the truth of the Word of God. You're going to hear the truth here at Grace on the Hill Church. And I'm going to give you scripture and plenty of context of the Word of God to, to, to back it up. The fact checker is the word of God, and here you have it. Right in front of your screen, open up your Bibles, follow along, you'll see it for yourself. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, what is that? What's clamor? Perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding, always looking for faults in everybody. Um, yeah, he's not sitting down right. Oh, he's not wearing the right shirt. That pastor shouldn't wear that colored shirt like that. Oh, he's wearing jeans. Oh, Look at his hair. Look, he's bald. Or 
Paul Fartik. Oh, look, look at how he's talking to him. Look. Put it be put away from you. Slander, slandering somebody, talking down on somebody's name, along with every kind of malice, which is spitefulness, verbal abuse. How many of us are being verbally abusive? You don't have to punch somebody in the mouth to be ver abusive. It could be verbal, it could be emotional, psychological abuse. Verse 32, be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another, just as in Christ, God in Christ also forgave you. That's crucifying. Guess what it's doing, brothers? This is what it is. You are crucifying the desires of the flesh, of the natural mind to go, uh-uh. This person did me wrong. I'm not holding any bitterness because I crucified that. You know what? Somebody really made me upset, but you know what? I'm not going to be re reacting and responding with anger and wrath because I crucified that. I'm no longer having resentment and fault finding because I crucified that. I'm not spiteful and, and doing uh, having being verbally abusive because emotionally and psychologically uh, uh, abusive because I have crucified it. And because I've crucified it, I'm kind and helpful to one another. I'm tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Are you truly crucified with Christ this morning? Are we truly crucified with Christ this morning? Go with me to James chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. And this will, we will be wrapping up our sermon with these two, two scriptures. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. Understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to hear, be careful and thoughtful listener, slow to speak, slow to anger, patient, reflective, forgiving, for the resentful, deep-seated anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Have you this morning crucified your anger? Because it does not produce the righteousness of God. And if we want to be in right standing with God this morning and you have anger, you can, you can, you listen, you can, you can obey the whole word of God in its entirety. But if you have anger, and you, you, you know, resentful, deep seated anger, where it becomes like wrath, it does not produce the righteousness of God. You lack one thing. Yeah, you, you obeyed the whole entire Bible, but you forgot one thing, you lack one thing, and that is the anger that's deep-seated in your heart. So get rid of all uncleanness and all that remains of wickedness, and with a humble spirit, receive the word of God, which is implanted, actually rooted in your heart, which is able to save your soul. Are we crucifying? What we need to crucify this morning. Have we truly been crucified with Christ? John uh, chapter 3, verse 30. He, who's he, Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. I have to be crucified with Christ. I, look, Jesus didn't have to do this. Being God in the flesh, he didn't even have to come down to earth and into the, the form of a man to be, to be uh, ridiculed, to be suffered, to go through what he went through. He didn't have to do that. But understand this, that he humbled himself. And this morning, brothers and sisters, in order to be crucified with Jesus Christ, you have to humble yourself. Let go of that ego. Let go of that pride. And say, you know what? Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I, I lack one thing, and this is what I lack. And, and I need to have him increase and I decrease. I'm going to be crucified with him. I'm going to crucify my sinful nature with him. I'm going to crucify myself. It's not all about me anymore. And when, and when people come against me and, and, and try to uh, accuse, falsely accuse me or do anything, I'm going to be like a sheep to a slaughter like Jesus was because I have crucified myself with Christ. Praise God. I hope you were blessed this morning. That concludes our sermon. I, I, I hope and pray this morning that moving forward, if you haven't already did, be crucified with Christ. Ask yourself, am I truly crucified with Christ? Or is it all about me? Praise God. Let's bow our heads this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for everything that you're doing. Uh, Father, you're just, oh, Lord, just, just revealing your wisdom and knowledge and understanding with us. Father, for you wish that none of us will perish. You want us all to be in heaven with you. And, and Father, you're just 
giving us the word like it is. You're speaking the truth to us like it is, Father, so that we can inherit the kingdom of God, that we can inherit heaven, Lord, that we can be dancing on streets of gold with you, Lord. Father, Lord, listen, Father, we know that sometimes you can come at us in, 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 a, in maybe even a harsh way. Some, some folks watching this this morning, some individuals may think like, wow, that's harsh. But Father, you, you're willing to discipline us, Father, so that we can learn, so because you love us, Lord. So that, again, so that we may be and unity with you in heaven. Father, to you be the honor, glory, and praise. We thank you for all things, Lord. Father, we worship you this morning. Father, I pray, Lord, that everyone who heard this message, Father, that they, Father, crucified themselves that with you, Lord, be crucified with Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, that concludes our sermon this morning and our service. We thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday with the help of the Lord. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful and prosperous week. God bless.